Hey, History Seeking here and today we'll take a walking tour of the 13th century Pickering Castle standing on the edge of the North Yorkshire Moors. It was owned by William the Conqueror from 1066 to 1087 and over the years passed to several other kings. In 1926 it was taken over by the Crown which is now looked after by English heritage. The main purpose of the castle was to provide accommodation for the king and his retinue. They enjoyed hunting in the surrounding forest. William the Conqueror founded castles in Scarborough and Pickering. The original earthwork castle at Pickering dates from 1069 to 1070 when William suppressed revolts throughout the north during this period he built many castles castles to help him control the English and defend the territory against the Danes and Scots. The Mott and Bailey design was very common in the Yorkshire area when Henry I issued a charter at Pickering in 1108, he must have stayed at the earth and timber fortification. Throughout the medieval period, this strategically important castle remained in royal hands or within the royal family through the earls and dukes of Lancaster. The gatehouse at Pickering is a modest and lightly defended opening. It is likely that the gate passage was protected by a drawbridge and a double door set in an arched entrance, the shape of which can be made out in the stonework above the present opening. This entrance was flanked by war walks. These would have allowed the defenders to attack any intruders who had broke down the drawbridge but were halted in front of the wooden doors. The order for the building of the gatehouse at Pickering was given in 1323, but it may have not been completed at the time of Edward II's death in 1327. Before us is a stretch of wall, a slight flattening of the inner bank indicates the site of the stables, when hunting played a prominent part in the castle's daily life, stabling for horses, kennels for dogs and rooms for their grooms and handlers would have been essential. According to the Tudor survey they were a stone roofed two storey building with three rooms on each floor measuring 240 feet, 73 metres long by 18 feet, 5.5 metres broad and 18 feet 5.5 metres high. It was partially of stone, partially of wood, the upper storey presumably being timber framed. This range is likely to have been of the 15th century date. During the 12th century, many timber buildings within older castles were replaced or upgraded with stone. Evidence shows that the old hall was the first stone building on the site. In 1180 to 1187, in Henry I's reign, work on the bridge, the inner curtain wall, entrance and Coleman Tower were carried out. The second phase of building works under John in 1207 to 1210 works on the bridge at the entrance to the inner ward on either side of the bridge. The king visited the castle in 1201 and again in August 1208. This square tower at the southwestern corner of the outer ward has usually been known as the Mill Tower. 
a mill near the castle is recorded from Henry III's time, perhaps referring to a water mill standing beside the Pickering Beck in the valley below. Cleaning the castle's mill ponds and repairing its dam wall were regular labour services, similar to the repair of the Hersian for the bond tenants. Alternatively, it is possible that the tower took its name from a horse mill in this corner of the outer ward. This is suggested by a statement in the 1537 survey that by that time there was no longer a horse mill at the castle. A horse-powered crushing wheel would have been used for grinding coarse flour and animal feed. The tower itself was in disrepair in 1537, but has been put back in good order by 1621. The ground floor was probably then used as a prison while the upper floor chamber, with its fireplace and latrine, could have housed the goler. By 1651, the outer walls were still sound, but the interior had been stripped of lead, iron and timber and so could no longer be used as a prison. The ground floor is entered from the outer ward through a double doorway, linked by a short bolted passage. The sockets for the hinges and latches show that the first door opened inwards and the second outwards, measures of security which suggest the tower may have been desired as a prison from the first. The lower room is only lit by a narrow slit, and the first floor room, which is larger, was entered through a similar double doorway from steps against the western side of the curtain wall. On the east wall is a square-headed fireplace and in the northeast corner a doorway leading to a short newel staircase contained in the circular turret, giving access to the tower roof. Between 1180 and 1326, successive kings strengthened the castle. As part of this process, the wooden fortifications were replaced in stone and the walls strengthened with numerous towers. To the north of the castle lay a large forest, which was reserved for rural hunting. Special laws applied within the bounds of the forest and the penalties for encroaching upon it or poaching game could be harsh. The Mott and the Inner Ward are the oldest parts of the castle, indeed they are originally the whole of the castle. The Outer Ward was added later, first protected by an earthen bank and ditch, and then in the 14th century by a stone wall. Exactly the same sequence happened earlier with the Inner Ward. First in the late 11th century, it was defended by a timber wall, with a deep ditch outside it on the south and east side. Then the timbers were replaced by stone during the late 12th century. The courtyard formed the domestic heart of the castle. It contained the main hall, private rooms, kitchens, food stores and brew house. When the king was in residence, it would have been teeming with life and activity. When he was absent, the main resident would have been the constable or steward who had their own private apartments and was in command of a small permanent garrison. At such times, the hall would have been used as a law court, with the chaplain probably acting as the clerk of the court. The inner ward was at first defended by a timber fence, but this was replaced in stone during the 12th century. The Coleman Tower behind flanks what was originally the main entrance to the castle, before the curtain wall and towers of the outer ward were added. Later it became the entrance to the inner ward. It was protected by a gateway, now completely vanished and by the inner ditch, which still survives. The ditch was spanned by a succession of timber bridges, of which the present modern bridge is the latest. The first recorded bridge was repaired in 1185 to 1186, and further repairs were ordered in 1238. A movable bridge was replaced by a drawbridge in 1323, on the orders of Edward II. The drawbridge would have pulled up against a pair of wooden gates, 
and the arch of the stone entrance passage. This passage stood forward of the line of the curtain wall and its foundations survive alongside and below the present bridge. Above the passage was a storeroom which in Tudor times was used to house the rills and records of the manor and the forest. In a survey of 1537, it was known as the Grace Chamber, perhaps meaning his Grace Chamber. The king was referred to as his Grace, but it was not in domestic use. By 1621, it was completely decayed. In front of us are the foundations of the new hall, which was rebuilt in 1314 for the Countess Alice de Lacey, wife of Thomas, Earl of Lancaster. It cost £341, 15 shillings and 8 pence, which is more than £35,000 in modern money. It had two storeys and a stone tiled roof. The private chamber of the Countess may well have occupied the upper floor at the northern end. This was elaborately plastered room with a fireplace decorated with plaster of Paris. 400 cartloads of stone were used to build the new hall, although it was predominantly timber framed. In 1621, John Norden, a land surveyor employed by James I, described it as of post and pan deconstruction, meaning of timber posts and infilled panels of plaster, covered wattle work. Much of the surviving architectural details belongs to the late 12th and 13th centuries. It must therefore be assumed that the new work concentrated on the upper storey and the roof, perhaps also providing larger windows. The Tudor surveys call this building the King's Hall, and then it was in regular use as a courthouse. However, the upper floor and roof timbers were in decay, and by Norden's time it was unsafe to use. Thirty years later, in 1651, it had been abandoned and was almost fallen to the ground. At the southeast corner is the principal doorway. The base of its triple jammed shafts show that they supported a finely moulded arch. Two steps leading down into the hall and on the left south wall contains a doorway to the pantry and buttery. On the right, the east wall has two window recesses and on the west in the curtain wall are two further recesses. The southerly one is mostly destroyed, but it appears to have housed a fireplace. The northerly one was framed within an arch, of which the left-hand jamshaft base survive. Within the arch was a stone seat. There was a similar recess seat in the old hall, and both may have served as the presidential chair of the Lord Steward when the hall was used for law courts. The hall is over 40 feet, 30 metres wide, and its roof would have been supported on two rows of wooden pillows. At the northwest corner of the new hall, a doorway leads into a passage or gallery between the two halls. This passage allowed the Countess to have private access to the chapel through a west doorway, which is now blocked. In 1314, it was ordered that the passage be roofed with planks. The castle was maintained from the income of a large estate, which provided timber, stone, fish and game. Large flocks of sheep also grazed on the surrounding pasture. Their wool was brought to the castle to be stored in wool hull and later sold in large bales. In the Middle Ages, wool accounted for one sixth of the estate's income. By about 1400, this estate was managed by the constable of the castle who lived in a substantial lodgings within the walls. The chapel is the only surviving roof building. The first mention of the chapel is in 1227, when a chalice and two vestments were ordered for it. It is therefore probable that the chapel building was started in 1226 to 1227. A chaplain was appointed in 1238, supported by royal income. Pickering Castle had a resident chaplain from that date until 1547, when all chantry chapels were closed 
and their income confiscated under Henry VIII. The chaplain's income came from two main sources. In 1374, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, granted the chaplain the revenues of the Hospital of St Nicholas, outside the castle on condition that he maintained its fabric. Soon after 1460, Edward IV established a chantry of Our Lady within the castle, giving the chaplain additional income. Money would be given in return for masses sung for the souls of the dead. By 1546, however, the castle chapel was known as the Chapel of St Nicholas and was used for saying masses for the souls of the Duke of Lancaster. A century later, the chapel was being used as a courtroom and no longer had a religious function. The original stonework of the chapel is of small rubble. The four western lancet windows, two on either side, are original, as in the doorway with a pointed head and outer dripstone. The chapel has seven windows, which were newly glazed in 1325. The west end had partially shortened, and the east end shows a variety of changes. The large ashlar blocks making later work, dating from Tudor period. The chapel was much restored early in the 19th century and re-roofed again about 45 years ago. The interior now contains an exhibition in its castle and its role as a hunting lodge. The third phase is more extensive, one lasting from 1218 to 1236 and was largely a response to the insecurity and unrest of Henry III's minority. The young Henry's position was threatened by both the French who wanted to claim the throne, for the Dauphin Louis and by a group of rebellious barons in the north of England. Peace was finally established in 1217 and Geoffrey de Neville, the Sheriff of Yorkshire, was ordered to sustain the castles of Pickering and Scarborough from the revenues of the Shire. In 1220, a jury at Pickering inquired into what state the castle was in when Geoffrey began work there after the peace. That is how much was then standing, how much fell or was destroyed. The main work carried out under Geoffrey was the rebuilding and strengthening of existing walls. The sums involved were considerable. Between 1218 and 1226, Geoffrey was estimated to have spent 1,000 marks, equal to 667 pounds. In the King's service, it is two castles. A further sum of 200 marks, £132, was spent in 1226 when the pace of work was stepped up. One result of this work was the chapel first mentioned in 1227. Another may have been replaced of the outer shell of the keep, judging by the style of its masonry. The new hall in its earliest form may also date from this period and the entrance would have needed to be brought up to a contemporary Defensive standard. During Henry III's reign and beyond, the outer ward or barbican was protected by a palisade of pointed stakes called the Harrison. This was maintained by labour services which fell due every third year.
Rosamond's Tower is the northmost of the new towers, stands astride the inner ditch. This allowed a small gate or posting to be placed in the ditch bottom. Edward II's instructions of 1323 included the building of a posting next to the King's Tower, i.e. the keep, but it is not known why or when the name Rosamond was first associated with the building. Henry II's mistress was known as Fair Rosamond, but she had died more than a century earlier. In common with the other towers of the outer ward, it projects beyond the outer curtain wall. It is constructed of larger, squarer rubble blocks than the earlier work and has ashlar dressing and a parpet supported by a moulded cornice. At the bottom of the tower is the post and passage, which was closed by a small drawbridge towards the outer ditch. A single chain or rope for lowering the bridge passed through a hole which is still visible over the centre of the arch. The ground floor is reached through a small chamfered and fluted round-headed doorway on the outer edge of the inner ditch. This leads into a small passage lit by two small rectangular windows. The room itself is lit by a cruciform arrow slit and the joist holes show the position of the floor. The upper room of the tower, which is no longer accessible, was entered by steps from the curtain wall a little further east. A corridor with two narrow rectangular slits lead through the tower at this level and continue on through the added east turret to the wall walk of the inner ward. This room was provided with a latrine in the thickness of the wall and with two windows of different sizes. On the south face of the parapet is a small cruciform slit set to skew and more decorative than defensive. The Coleman Tower is a plain square tower and was probably the work of Henry II from 1154 to 1189 or one of his sons and was built to control the adjacent entrance to the inner ward. The ground floor level was probably used as a prison. This function is mentioned in a document of 1323 and as was unusual in medieval prisons, there are no openings for windows or doors. Offenders against the forest laws and petty criminals, thieves and brigades from the Pickering district would have been locked up here. The prison was later moved to the mill tower in the outer ward. The upper floor would have housed the soldiers, defending the staircase and guarding the entrance. One doorway led to the staircase, another now blocked, to a room over the entrance passage, where the drawbridge and portcullis mechanism could be worked. The tower roof could also be reached from here. The keep is at the heart of the castle's defences. The grassy mound in which the stairway climb is a man-made hill or mot built on William the Conqueror's orders to command the surrounding territory. From this vantage point it would have been possible to look southwards across the Vale of Pickering towards Moulton to control the Valley Edge Road from Scarborough on the east coast to Helmsley and Rildale on the west and to dominate the track leading northwards over the moors to Whitby. The earth mound topped by a timber tower would have been given a psychological as well as a physical advantage to the soldiers stationed on its summit. Their leader could easily command all parts of the castle defences simultaneously. Today the mott and ditches are left to grow wild for a three year period before being cut back. The result is a great variety of floral including rare plants, owls and bats. From the mott summit can easily see the two main divisions of the castle Northwest, towards Newtondale, is the inner ward, with its closely packed domestic buildings set on the edge of the rocky valley. Southeast towards the town is the outer ward, enclosed by a curtain wall, which sheltered the castle store sheds and stables. The timber tower was set within a circular palisade or fence, later rebuilt in stone to form a shell keep, part of which survive. This outer wall itself, probably a rebuilding of an earlier stone enclosure, dates to the early part of Henry III's reign from 1216 to 1272. A ring of lean-to buildings in the area would have provided a secure private lodging for the king. Some of their foundations are still visible. In Edward II's reign, from 1307 to 1327, 
The keep was known as the King's Tower, but by Tudor times it was in ruin. The wall of the Shell Keep is roughly circular inside, but it is made up of short lengths of straight walling on the outside. This outer face uses squarish rubble blocks, with smooth ashlar dressing at the base at the quitons, forming the junction of the straight lengths, and around the window slits. The two full heights blade arrow slits on the north side are all that survive of a series of windows, probably ten that were originally evenly spaced around the tower. The flat part of the wall above them shows the original height of the wall walk. The shell keep originally had two entrances, both giving access to the top of the wall, which ran up the slopes of the mound. The letter entrance was on the east and the steps leading up from inside the keep to its doorway are still visible. This entrance would have given patrolling soldiers access to a continuous wall walk around the inner ward. The major entrance was on the west, but its archway has been destroyed. In 1255, the castle was taken out of the care of the sheriff and placed in the custody of the judiciary, Hugh Bigard. In 1264, war again broke out between Henry III and his barons, led by Simon de Montfort. After being held captive, Henry was restored to power at Evesham in the following year. Although the war did not seriously affect the northern counties, Bigard supported the king and put the castles at Pickering and Scarborough in a good state of defence. Bigot held Pickering until his death in 1266. In 1267, the honour and castle of Pickering was among the lands granted to Henry III's younger son, Edmund Crouchback, as part of the territorial settlement when he was created Earl of Lancaster. In that year, the castle was described as being weak and of no value, its fabric costing one pound to maintain. It was certainly old-fashioned when compared with the compact, multi-towered castles that Edward I and his favourite barons were building in the north of Wales at that time. Edmund's son Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, inherited extensive estates and acquired still more by his marriage to the heiress Alice de Lacey. Thomas regarded himself as the leader of the barons. Against the weak rule of his cousin Edward II, he schemed with the other leading barons against the king's favourite Piers Gaveston capturing him at nearby Scarborough Castle in 1312 and executing him after a summary trial. In 1314, Thomas carried out work on the new hall to create a fitting residence for the Countess Alice. He also maintained a garrison in the castle and carried out works to improve the defences. 
However, the events of 1322 came before he could make any major changes. This is the Sally Port from Rosamond's Tower. Many medieval kings visited Pickering Castle to take advantage of the excellent hunting provided by the adjacent forest. Deer and wild boar could be hunted in the forest with hounds and smaller game with hawks and falcons. To maintain the hunting, the king employed foresters and park keepers. In 1322, Edward II established a stud of about 50 horses in the castle. The Deontay Tower stands in an abrupt change of direction in the curtain wall. It is quite likely that the entire curtain wall was built first, in partially dressed rubble, and that the tower faced with ashlar above the wall walk was added later. The tower of three storeys and has a modern roof. Entry to the ground floor and first floor is through plain chamfered doorways with round heads. The ground floor room is lit by a single window, opposite the entrance. First floor doorway was reached by a wide flight of steps built against the back of the tower and formally carried on and over an arch across the approach to the room below. The main room was lit by two windows and was approached by a passage with a latrine in the wall thickness. A new old staircase led to the second floor, the western wall walk and the roof. The second room is larger than those below owing to a reduction in the thickness of the walls. It is well lit by two light transferred windows with cussed head dating from the 15th century. On the west wall is a square headed fireplace and a moulded mantle above. Beside it is a small square headed window. In the northeast corner a door leads to a latrine while in the east wall are two recessed cupboards and a small square headed window. This made an attractive self-contained room for a captain of the guard or a person of similar rank.
Thanks all for watching. Do take care and have a fantastic week ahead.